When did Georgetown first begin admitting women? Enrollment records indicate the year was 1880, the same year Healy Hall was completed. That year, Jeanette J. Sumner and Annie E. Rice enrolled in the medical school. When the university archivist mentioned them a few years ago, I wondered about their backstory. Why did they stay only one year at Georgetown before transferring? They opened a clinic in DC after graduating. Was it a success? What is the legacy of their work today? Dr. Sumner and Dr. Rice were friends who blazed trails together, both at Georgetown for women students and in the practice of medicine in the nation's capital. It's no surprise that the path wasn't easy, but as it turns out, it also impacted their health in profound ways. Through census records, journal articles, patent records, books, and old DC newspaper clippings, we can learn a little more about these two remarkable women. Let this short film serve as an introduction to these visionary doctors and as an invitation to keep digging because it's clear that there's more to the story. Jeanette Judson Sumner was born in 1846 in Constantine, Michigan. Her father, Watson Sumner of Massachusetts, was the town doctor. Her mother, Hester Ann Welling, was from Baltimore originally. She had an older sister who died as a toddler and an older brother, George, who she lived with again later when they were adults. Her father died just a year after she was born. Property rights for women were weak at the time, so her widowed mother likely faced financial hardship. Census records suggest Jeanette lived some of her childhood years in Wisconsin with relatives, but in her 20s lived with her mother, brother, and his wife in Brooklyn, New York. Her brother became a rear admiral in the Navy, and by 1880, Jeanette moved to Washington, D.C. to live with him and his growing family in this home just off present-day Logan Circle. Annie Elmira Rice was born in Hallowell, Maine in 1854. Her family was in the whaling business and her father was the first American consul to Japan. Her family traveled there with some frequency in her youth. Her mother, Elmira W. Sampson, and her father, Alicia E. Rice, had three children, Annie the youngest and her two older brothers, Nathan, a physician in Illinois, and George, who eventually became the second consul to Japan and raised his family there. Annie suffered from some kind of heart ailment throughout her life. We don't know how Annie and Jeanette, or Nettie as she was sometimes called, became friends. Annie was 12 years younger than Jeanette. They both attended a science experiment conducted by Alexander Graham Bell in 1880 and wrote letters filed with the patent office attesting to their witness of his invention known as the photophone. They were ambitious, well-connected women Jeanette was a cousin of the famed abolitionist senator from Massachusetts, Charles W. Sumner. Annie's mother regularly entertained, as reported in the social columns of local papers. Perhaps they knew Georgetown's president at the time, Jesuit scholar and visionary Patrick Healy. His parents, an Irish father and former enslaved black mother, were committed to educating both their sons and daughters. This value may have led to his willingness to admit women to the university. Healy ran ads in the local paper to try and recruit students to the financially struggling enterprise of the medical department. Money may have been the prime motivator to recruit women, but at least he was unafraid to put the possibility into action. Our two aspiring physician women were unafraid to break down barriers and decided to enroll together at the all-male medical department at Georgetown in 1880. Classes were held in the evening at a somewhat dilapidated building downtown at 10th and East Streets Northwest. According to newspaper articles, neighbors complained about the unclean and poorly maintained anatomy lab, for example. Georgetown took over the space from another medical school called Columbian, which today is George Washington University. Georgetown's medical program had fewer than 50 students total in the three-year course. Likely, the educational environment for Jeanette and Annie was not ideal because for whatever reason, after one year, they transferred to the prestigious Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania, located in Philadelphia. The rigorous curriculum required all graduates to publish theses. Theirs were on uterine disease and women's health. Students came from around the world and alumni went on to establish clinics or lead medical education institutions in their home states and countries. Dr. Rice and Dr. Sumner returned to D.C. and opened a free clinic for women by women doctors, a wildly new concept in the nation's capital at the time. 
They were determined to offer patient-centered care for women that women physicians could uniquely provide. They hustled for space and funding and even wrote a letter to the head of Georgetown's medical school asking for medical equipment and furnishings from a dispensary the university had decided to close. They invited several Georgetown and Columbian professors to be part of the consulting board and had a long list of men and women offering financial and administrative support for the venture. They also got funding from the federal government. Weeks later, they opened the Women's Dispensary, a free clinic at 937 New York Avenue, primarily serving women of color. The physicians saw paying patients in their own practice across the street in the mornings and evenings and operated the clinic every day from noon to three. They treated 1,000 patients in their first year in a city with a population of around 130,000 at the time. Unfortunately, just less than a year after opening the clinic, in January of 1884, Dr. Rice succumbed to exhaustion and died. Just days before, she willed all of her inheritance and their shared clinic property over to her friend and partner, Dr. Sumner. The setback must have been tough, losing her friend and business partner, but Dr. Sumner managed to keep the clinic operating another 12 years, training a new generation of women clinicians and caring for thousands of women and their families in DC. For the first three years, she was the only attending physician. She eventually brought in fellow Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania alum, Ida Heiberger. Financial pressure and the increased demand for training medical students at Georgetown forced Dr. Sumner to take on some male doctors and students. Dr. Heiberger left after a year, likely frustrated with the change, and went on to start the successful women's clinic based on the same principle of women doctors treating women patients. Sumner's women's dispensary moved to a new, larger location in Southwest DC at Maryland Avenue and Four and a Half Streets, near where the Air and Space Museum stands today. By 1890, they had strayed dramatically from the original mission, with patients increasingly getting surgical procedures and predominantly male student trainees and observers. The shift may have been disheartening for Dr. Sumner. Census records from 1900 show her living at St. Elizabeth's, the government hospital for the insane. She was admitted there in 1896 and spent the last 10 years of her life there, dying in 1906. Her patient record is on file at the National Archives, currently closed to the public due to the pandemic. But a helpful librarian there took a peek and said it's over 100 pages long and includes documents from the last 10 years of her life, including letters and clinical notes. Did she check herself in? Was she brought there? Why? How was she treated? Who visited her? Did she try to leave? Dr. Jeanette J. Sumner is buried in an unmarked grave in DC's Rock Creek Cemetery, just steps from her friend and fellow Hoya, Dr. Annie E. Rice. As the first women to enroll at Georgetown, their legacy deserves more attention and research, and perhaps some commemorative space on campus. Today, we all benefit from the heavy doors these brave, visionary doctors opened during a transformative chapter in our city and campus, and for women in medicine. Okay, so that was our little story. Um, and 
I think thank you, Jenny. Jenny. It's it's amazing. Great. Thank you so much <laughs> for sharing with us. There is so many comments in the in the chat. Um, congratulating you. Great. Yes. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Jane. Well, yeah, I just, I mean, I'm really ready to just open up the floor to questions. It's, um, you know, the, the documentary just kind of scratches the surface and um, I can, I'll do my best to kind of fill in some gaps or um, share with you some more. And Carlos can talk to about how, what we, how we um, worked on it as a team. So um, I'm open to, to questions. So I don't know how you want to do it, Melissa. Uh, I think if you can raise your hand, it would be great. And I think Bill Cesato uh, did that already. <laughs> do you want Do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Sure, Jane and Carlos, that was fantastic. Great, great work. I, I just can't wait to watch it again and again, actually. Um, <laughs> what I wanted to ask you, since I love archival research, Jane, which feels like detective work, tell us a little bit about the process you went through to piece together uh, these stories of these women's lives. Sure. Um, so it kind of began for me uh, with an article in the magazine that uh, I'm the editor of the Georgetown, used to be called Georgetown Medicine Magazine. It's now Georgetown Health. And um, I think it was in 2017, we did an issue on women in medicine. Mm -hmm. And we had a story about the history of trailblazers at Georgetown. And that's when I first was introduced to Annie and Jeanette. And, um, but the, the numbers kept not working quite right. Like, there were conflicting numbers about when they were born and when they died and um, where their clinic was and what it was called. And it just so I had to keep kind of digging around uh, in the records I could find, which there wasn't a lot. Um, and our writer, Patty North, um, who's a colleague of mine, she was digging around too. We were both kind of having fun trying to figure it out, but it just left more questions and answers. So we, we kept the write-up short in the magazine. <laughs> And even then we misspelled Jeanette's name, which I still feel a little bad about, but it's two N's, two T's. But um, uh, so that's kind of what started the, the that piqued my interest. And then, um, you know, when I realized the Gender Justice Initiative had these fellowships, I thought, well, now's the time to finally dig in a little more deeply. And I had the benefit of being redeployed in January for a few months for Georgetown. So during that time, I really dug dug around more into um, some of the uh, historic records. And I have a friend who's a history professor at UMKC and, and she studies women's history. And she does a lot of work with archival material and kind of non-traditional ways of trying to piece together the stories of women, which are often left out of the record books. So she said, Jane, just get, get a start with a membership to ancestry.com, which I thought sounded kind of crazy, but uh, went ahead and did that. And um, that was a really great way to start to piece together who, who their families were because they weren't, um, you know, they were well-connected women. So to learn that one of them, her father was the first consul to Japan, I was like, oh, these are well-connected women. And Jeanette's brother being a rear admiral in the Navy, you know, they, they were, um, they couldn't have done, I think, what they did without the kind of network they had. So does that answer your question? It does. Thank you so much. And again, congratulations. Really, Thanks. really, really wonderful work. Thanks. I could talk a little. Oh, yeah. Okay. Camille. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, congratulations, Jane and Carlos. I really, really loved this video and um, just exploring the wonderful pictures and everything. And, and you said something about the end about how you, um, some of the archives that were closed during the pandemic um, prevented you from answering some of those final questions about the final years of her life. And I was just wondering if you think you might have an opportunity, when it might be open again, and whether you're gonna continue researching about her. Great. Yeah. Well, um, I, one thing I learned about this process is, um, and Bill, you probably know this too, you, you become friends with these librarians and, uh, that's, I realize that's also kind of key to getting, getting certain doors opened when, 
other doors would normally be closed. So I um, struck up a friendship with the librarian at the National Archives, who um, kind of, when the archives were closed, she still went down because she became curious about Jeanette's story. And she went down and opened up her record to see if there were any photos for me, which there weren't. But she copied a couple of pages and emailed them to me. And then um, just about three weeks ago, she emailed me and said that they're available now to get copies made of the entirety of the file. So it's 100 pages. So I placed an order for that. Um, it'll probably be another month before they arrive. But um, yeah, I still have the bug. So I can't wait to dig in and see, you know, a little more about what happened to her there. The few pages I saw were really they were a little upsetting, honestly, to see how she was treated um, as a patient there. And uh, it was kind of dehumanizing, it sounds like, just from the little bit of the record that I saw. So, um, um, you know, it'll probably take me a while to go through those 100 pages, and I, I'm going to take my time with it. So nothing gets too, nothing's too triggering. But, um, you know, she was a woman who, um, would have been diagnosed with grandiosity um, for her time, but whereas men in her position would have been described as ambitious. So it's it's considered a you know a clinical a disorder to have grandiosity, but um, it just means a visionary. And so um, so we'll see what's 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 in there and what comes of that. I don't know, Carlos. Do you have anything to add? Do you have anything you'd like to say about that or? Yeah, um, I mean, first of all, thank you guys for all the support in the chat. Um, good to see you again, Jane. It's been a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I was copied on a lot of the um, emails with the archive people. Um, and, and you can just, you're reminded of, of the time period that, that these women were um, entering Georgetown when, when you see like the stigmas around mental health just in general and then with women specifically. And so it's disheartening at times, but I mean, um, on the bright side, I remember when when Jane, when I was uh, added onto this project, Jane was very much big on like, this is, the purpose of this documentary is not to cover everything. It's just to kind of like inspire others to kind of um, keep researching as well. Um, and it kind of worked out <laughs> that the that the National Archives were closed because of COVID. Um, and that kind of fell in line with how deep we were trying to go with this documentary. Um, but yeah, I mean, like the title suggests there's more to the story. And it was also just very cool just being able to drive around DC in, uh, in Jane's Volkswagen with the top down um, and being able to see these buildings like um, like um, St. Elizabeth's was, was still there. Um, they're turning into apartments now, which is very interesting to see. Uh, but we were able to drive around the neighborhood, but then like where their clinic was, like it's like a Starbucks now. And so it's like kind of interesting to, you never know what you're gonna get when you go to the actual locations, like when you find the address in the archives, like sometimes you'll go and you'll see like a St. Elizabeth's building that she was saying, and we're like, oh, is it this one, is it this one, is it this one? But then other times you'll just see like urban development. And so that part was also very cool. Hi, June. Hi, yes, um, very, very inspiring. My question, um, and Carlos probably touched on this just a little bit. Um, I was wondering if you discovered anything during your research that didn't really fit into the narrative that you were working on, that you would go back and, and you know, kind of uh, take a look at, whether there were tidbits of information that um, would be interesting to pursue going forward. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the biggest, the biggest question for me is how did she go from being this woman who ran this really important uh, clinic in DC to a patient at St. Elizabeth's? Like what was the turning point? What was the diagnosis that brought her in there? Um, I will say that a cursory glance to the admitting documents listed that she had blindness, that that's why they brought her there. Um, so that really raises questions like what, why would blindness bring you to St. Elizabeth's? And um, uh, somebody suggested that um, it can actually be, uh, I'm not a clinician obviously, but um, it, could, 
it can be a symptom of um, a psychiatric episode can can cause blindness. So temporary blindness. So I don't know if that's what it was or not, but that's that's probably my biggest question is what happened with Jeanette. Um, I also am curious about how they met. Um, what when did they and where did they go to high school? Where did they get their their training to you know in reading and writing and research because you know they wrote these these theses at uh, the Women's Medical College. Um, where did they go? Where were they educated before that? So those are some of the outlying questions. I also wonder, um, you know, uh, so Jeanette, here's one, one piece that I, that came up in the record from St. Elizabeth. She got a letter from her, um, a cousin whose name is Sumner also, and I don't remember now his first name, but he was a representative from California, a U.S. representative from California, and he was in visiting for a congressional session and he wrote to St. Elizabeth and said, you know, can I, can I visit her? And I, so I don't know if he was given permission to visit her, if there's anything, in, any information in there. Um, I believe he was a poet as well as a U.S. representative, as of course so many are. So <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so maybe there's some of his writings that will shed some light on her story. And maybe there's some fa some family photos that are still out there because she was so well connected to the Sumner. I mean, the Sumner family was spread far and wide, but almost every Sumner you read about was related to Charles W. Sumner that I've found. So um, um, yeah, those are some of the pieces. Thank you. Yeah, Bill. I was just going to ask, Jane, did, did um, many of the Georgetown records themselves, other than the catalog, uh, mention the two uh, women in their letters or documents that remain? Um, there's scarce information mm -hmm. about them in our library, in our archives. So um, the only mention I found of their names was the, that letter um, okay. that you could see in there that where they're asking for equipment to be donated to them. Okay. So that's all I found. That doesn't mean there isn't some more tucked in there somewhere. <laughs> um, I went, when I heard that Patrick Healy was the president at the time, when I, when I realized that, I thought, well, maybe there's something in his diary that said like, oh, I had to let in those two women because we're, we're broke or whatever. <laughs> and uh, so, um, so I, that was really interesting. I got to read through some of his diaries, but I'll say that he wrote very, small and cursive and it's kind of faded so it was hard for me to read what I did find all I found was um, a log of his travels while he's going to fundraise which I thought was kind of funny <laughs> you know he's out in California just asking for money so um but I think there's there could be more to it he must have had a reaction he must have known that 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 was an exceptional moment in Georgetown's history so um, I, I would imagine there's some record somewhere of him commenting on it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Jane, hi, this is Kim, how are you? Hi, good to see you, Kim. Good to see you too. This was truly a, a wonderful, um, just a wonderful documentation of this historic um, event and sort of a follow up to the last question. I'm just wondering, did you learn anything more about maybe, so after they were admitted, I'm just curious how long after they had, were admitted were more women admitted and what was, do we know anything about the long, you know, further trajectory of the inclusion of women at Georgetown, um, anything like that? Sure. Well, um, we're lucky to have Bill Sasato here on the, <laughs> on the Zoom because he can tell us a little more about that. But I believe, you know, and that I, I call these, I call these two women the first known women to have attended Georgetown. There may have been some that weren't 
recorded um, in in this way. You know, they were written up on their on the enrollment records, um, and somebody found them just by reading through and finding their first names and saying, "Well, Jeanette and Annie, that those are women." You know, so. Um, a lot of the class, their classmates only have their first initials. So I believe that it was just only these two, but who knows? And uh, who knows if there were people before them or that who came after, but um, from the best that we can tell is just these two. Um, and so after they left in 1881, the next women didn't come until the early 1900s. And Bill, did you wanna say when, Sure. So, and this is, oh yeah, thank you, uh, Jane. And I agree with you saying first is always difficult because you learn, no, no, actually there are all these new file will give you new information about a first. So um, Lynn Conway actually discovered a list in the archives um, about the sisters of visitation uh, were actually being educated through the grill at visitation convents starting around, I guess, the 1910s. So uh, they weren't considered regular students at Georgetown. Uh, in the 1920s, and this is something I worked on with Lynn Conway and Anne Galloway, um, three sisters of St. Francis who were administering the hospital and the nursing school were awarded Bachelor of Arts degrees. And a daughter of charity named Sister Flavia Egan was awarded a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. I'm the communications director at the School of Nursing and Health Studies. That's kind of was the angle we came in at. Um, but it all kind of started with the 1957 alumni directory. I had noticed um, there were two, two women in 1926 who were also religious sisters who had gotten the baccalaureate in nursing. And that was well before a time that we thought we were conferring baccalaureates uh, upon women. So uh, sort of did a little bit more research into them and then learned sometime later that there were women in 1920. This is all getting to Jane's point that you just can keep going back further. Uh, for my, um, I'm also in the Doctor of Liberal Studies program. Um, one of my uh, focus areas is on uh, women who started being uh, publicly recognized through the baccalaureate in nursing. And it seems like that was around 19, that was in 1943 that the first uh, women were awarded bachelor's degrees in a public manner at Georgetown. So it's definitely, to Jane's point at the end, these areas just are so rich for research possibilities. Yeah, and I should add that um, this was really part, it was kind of the culminating project of my Master of Arts in Liberal Studies. So, um, and Bill Sasato encouraged me years ago to, uh, to join the Liberal Studies program, which I really um, got a lot out of. And my professor, um, uh, Professor Danielovich is here on the call too. She, um, she taught a course that I took, an undergraduate course called Culture, Medicine, and Gender, and which I highly recommend. And um, it's, I think it's got a different name now, but I, I had met another undergraduate student who told me it was the best course she took at Georgetown. And so that's why I, I enrolled in it. And it really provided the groundwork for a lens for looking critically at what these women were facing at that time and in their work and, the, um, and particularly um, their mental health. So um, I just wanna say hello to Professor Danielovich. Thank her for coming too. I don't know if you wanna say anything about that, that work and that class. Um, gosh, well, I think it's just so, um, interesting to, you know, see what you've done as, you know, an extension of thinking through the ways in which bias and medicine intersect. So that's all I'll say that you've done amazing work here. Well, I want to thank her also because she taught in the class, she taught us how to edit Wikipedia pages. That was a big part of our our work. And so that was something I had hoped to do through the fellowship um, as a last little piece to, to complete this project was to update Wikipedia pages or create Wikipedia pages for Dr. Sumner and Dr. Rice. So I got that started, but um, not very, I didn't get very far. So that's another great project if somebody's looking to, 
to kind of continue this. Um, it's a wonderful way to get their their names out there into the common vernacular of you know first round of research. Um, yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? Oh yes, Neri Patrick. Oh, I see. Yeah, and Christy. Christy. Oh, hi, Gray. Jane. This is John. Oh, hi. Um, Sorry. Uh, enjoyed the video, and I had a question about the Alexander Graham Bell tie-in. Oh yeah. Um, how did you come to get find that tidbit, and how far before <laughs> Georgetown was that for those two? And were there other women in that seminar or? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't actually remember what year that was now. Um, I don't have that off the top of my head. It's in the documentary, I think, and the letters are on file. So that one came up from a regular old, I won't say a Google search, I'll, I'll say a DuckDuckGo search. It's a search engine that I use that um, finds things sometimes a little off the, off the beaten path of the Google algorithms. So um, I searched for Annie E. Sum Annie E. Rice in parentheses and um, Sumner or something like that. And it came up because they had her listed as Nettie Sumner. Um, and that's how I learned that that was a nickname of hers um, when she was a little younger, or maybe she used it throughout. But I also think she was left-handed because of the the way she signed her name, it looks, she's got an angle that, that bends left. So um, I don't know, just to get a good Catholic handwriting coach or something, but uh, in grade school, but <laughs> cursive. Um, but anyway, that's, so that's how I found that was just through, through DuckDuckGo. And there, that um, document is on file at the um, Libra Library of Congress, I think. Um, but if you search off Alexander Graham Bell and Annie E. Rice, you'll probably be able to find it too. <laughs> so I don't know um, how many others were there, but what's cool is that it was for a photo phone. And, um, um, you know, I have no idea what they were really doing there, but it sounds like the iPhone, you know, it's the prototype for the iPhone. So these women did amazing things well ahead of their time. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Christy, hi. Hi, Jane. That was beautiful. Um, thank you to you and Carlos for this, this important work. I feel like I learned a lot about Georgetown. Like you think you know a place and then you realize you don't know anything really. Um, so I learned a lot about Georgetown. And then my question is, um, have you thought about or are there possibilities for sharing the documentary with incoming medical students or first year medical students or the whole lot of them or something like that um, as a way to ground our current experiences in history as well as stimulate discussion for the remaining legacy of, of gender bias and health and medicine and, and other things that we can think about? Wow, sure. I mean, I'd be thrilled to do that. Um, Bill was the one who um, encouraged me to dig around at the library and see if they would host the documentary. So it's going to be archived at Georgetown's library so anybody can watch it. And this event um, thank you, Melissa, by the way, for organizing it. Um, this event is being recorded so people can watch this, but I'd be happy to present this and answer questions to medical students anytime. Um, what's one thing I found interesting that I didn't really get into in the documentary was the whole um, challenge to get um, to get practical clinical experience for medical students. And that was part of the pressure that, the, um, that Dr. Sumner faced. Um, the Georgetown faculty were pressuring her to let them, let their students come in and experiment basically, you know, to learn, not, not experiment, but to learn through hands-on surgery. <laughs> and uh, I think she held them off as long as she could, but there was a demand throughout DC for practical experience for medical students because um, medical the medical student population was growing, but not the opportunities for 
internships, basically, and residencies. So some things haven't changed. <laughs> I think there's still a bottleneck at that point in the medical education, but um, uh, it raises a lot of ethical questions. Um, and I think it's part of why these two women were, they were trying to protect their patients and respect their need for the, um, just, you know, for a woman to be able to have a woman physician, um, no matter how wealthy or poor you are, no matter what your race or ethnicity is, whether you, um, who, whoever you are, it's nice to have a doctor who can understand your anatomy in a personal way. <laughs> so um, uh, again, there's more more material that I didn't include about this. Um, Jeanette Sumner gave a talk at the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania. After she graduated, she went back and presented a case for, about one of her patients who almost died and because she was so um, kind of embarrassed to share what the real symptoms of her uterine disease were. So she was treated for malaria and finally she allowed Dr. Sumner to do a more intimate investigation of what was going on and shared with her, yes, I have these other symptoms. And so she was able to then operate and save her um, because she had some uterine tumors, I believe. So, um, so yeah, it'd be great to share this with, with medical students um, and just, just as a way to, to um, dial up the conversation, I think. Great, thank you. And a terrific suggestion in the chat about the Medical Humanities Initiative and connecting with them. Oh, okay, great. Yes, I'll, Bill. I'll make the connection. Sorry, I'm just so many, this is more of a comment. Jane, I also really, really loved your idea of some kind of monument. Yeah. yeah I just wanted to say that, yeah. Yeah, that's something Carlos and I talked about. Um, just, I think it's it makes it, a, a real difference to have a physical space on campus to, um, especially because their story has been lost, kind of neglected for so long. Um, but I have a place in mind personally, um, maybe it's kind of, maybe we could do better, but I like that plaza at the back of the Med Dent building. Um, you know, it's kind of a new space and um, it's a communal gathering space. And one of the great things about their story that somebody, uh, that Professor Danielovich actually pointed out to me to think about was that they did it together. You know, they weren't, it wasn't one woman who was first at Georgetown, it was two women who were first or first known. And they did it as friends and, um, and how that kind of trailblazing work really goes better if you've got a partner or two, you know, so. Um, so I, I think that that space behind Med Dent might be a good candidate for naming after these two women. Um, you know, I think, I don't know if the surgical pavilion is still looking for a name, but uh, <laughs> that would be another option. Maybe they'll just give it Building D. They could rename Building D pretty easily. So, um, but yeah, what do you have any thoughts about that, Bill? Any, any targets on campus for Memorial or something? No, I just want to steal Dr. Graves' idea and say that a building seems better. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, buildings last longer than open courtyards. <laughs> Carlos, any other thoughts about, uh, about kind of the technical side of, of putting this together? Yeah, yeah, I mean, on the technical front, um, well, first of all, I want to respond to the whole memorial thing because I, I'm in, we need to have a space on campus that memorializes them. And I was just thinking about it when we were talking about it right now, but literally all the buildings on this campus are named after men, but that's its own thing. Anyway, on the technical aspect, I like, I was, I was, um, I remember Jane had a, a really solid outline of, of like the way we wanted the, the documentary structured and it was cool being able to balance kind of like what I was talking about earlier. Um, the um, footage that we found of like buildings um, that we were talking about versus like actual scans of like archival documents um, and photos, not of uh, Jeanette and Annie, but like of like the time period that they were in. 
Um, and so that was pretty cool to have a balance of both like media that we took ourselves, um, like filming around DC, but then also our archival um, documents that we found. And then probably my favorite um, like clip of the movie, which I didn't even film myself because I wasn't allowed in because of COVID, was the one of Jane looking through um, Patrick Healy's diary. And so that was cool. So I kind of have the combination of the two. Yeah, that was thanks to the librarian at Booth, who I've forgotten her name, but she was awesome. And she was there for me when I found that letter signed by them, which honestly brought me to tears. I couldn't believe it, you know, to have this original document. Um, there was something really special about that, something that they signed. And um, I loved the humility of it. Just like, hey, we hear you're closing. Can we have your used equipment? We're opening next week. <laughs> you know, we need your equipment. It's just, uh, it, it's also, it's, it revealed a little bit of their chutzpah, you know, their moxie, these two women trying to make all this happen in a quick turnaround with, you know, leftover equipment. So. I'm so grateful to everybody for, for coming to this program today and for, you know, all the support my family has given me and, and friends and colleagues along the way to um, make this little project come together. So um, my daughter, uh, uh, all my kids are interested in film and they all tinker around and some of them have become professional, but my daughter was telling me that, because uh, I, I was stumped about what to do about not having photos of the two women. I was really hoping to find their photos. And I said, you know, I have these little sketches that I made of my imagination of what they might've looked like. And she said, oh yeah, I use that. That's very common now in historic documentary filmmaking that they'll have somebody animate their idea of of uh, what the person might have been like, or you know, you just it's a great way to fill in when there are archival gaps. So um, so my kids helped me on this project too. So yeah, and um, I really encourage anybody who's thinking about, you know, I mean, part of why I wanted to make a documentary about this versus writing a paper about it is that because of this exact forum that may, maybe more people would get to know a little about their story through a short 10 minute piece versus reading my book or, you know, um, plus I didn't really feel like writing a book. <laughs> but um, uh, I feel like today it's how we consume information is through these kind of short videos. It's a great way to get, get information, history or current events. Um, um, but uh, the, Lounger Library was really helpful. Their tech staff was helpful for me in, um, you know, coming like some of the copyright things and music. They helped me figure out how to get music. And um, so I just, you know, I'm grateful to Georgetown for all the resources. And I encourage anybody who's kind of curious about it to tap into all the resources at the university because we have a rich tapestry of those. So. Okay, uh, there's a bunch of stuff in the chat. I haven't looked at the chat. Is there, oh, um, yes, and I think I saw that at one point, Angel White, she's here, which is awesome. Um, and she uh, asked about where we could watch the, the documentary later. So um, again, I think the library will have it. And also I think the Gender Justice Initiative website will probably have a recording of this. But if anybody wants um, to, to screen it, to watch it separately, you can just email me and I'll, um, I'll put my email in the chat and I can get you a, uh, I can um, find a way to get it to you so you can view it at, at your convenience. So um, I'll just put my Georgetown email in there. And we, can, we can definitely coordinate this. So what I'll do is that we'll send you, everybody who registered uh, for the event today, which was, three times more people than there are actually here. So these people definitely want to see it. So we'll send basically the recording and I thought we could also make it accessible 
for for those for in the meantime until it's actually accessible through the library and then obviously we'll have our this presentation on on our website as well and i actually answered to angel so i will send it to you <laughs> okay great and uh do you know jane when uh it will be accessible through the georgetown library um probably within the week um i'll it's just a matter of me getting them the file and them um, putting it where it goes. So I would imagine I'll try to take care of that in the next week or so. So that's great. So that way we can share that too, and we'll we'll put it on our website. Thank you again so much, Jane. This was and Carlos both. You did such an incredible job. Uh, telling the story of these two women, and uh, we can't we can't. I think we are all waiting for. Uh, part two, <laughs> right? <laughs> Am I the only one? <laughs> I feel like to get that file. <laughs> exactly the file, because now that we I, we hope that these national archives will actually reopen, you, and at least as you said, you will get the hundred page file about the last uh, years of uh, Janet's life, and probably there will be more there that you will discover. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping it leads to some some photos um, as well as more answers about what happened with her there. Um, so, and um, and I'm planning once I go through the hundred pages, I'm going to turn it over to Georgetown, so it'll be in our archive at the library. So, That's yeah, and I used part of my fellowship money to my last little bit to pay for those photocopies. So, thanks for the grant. <laughs> That's wonderful. And I'm wondering, does anyone know here, I know this is not the time probably, but how do we get to have a building or a square or something renamed? <laughs> is there a proper process? <laughs> uh, it's, it's such a great suggestion to have um, trailblazers, women, as, as Carlos was saying, when you think about it, there's not one building at Georgetown that um, is in honor of a a woman. I think there is there are two buildings at least maybe three that are named for women um, but there's they're small and not well known <laughs> but they are important women um, and Dahlgren Chapel was actually funded by a woman um, named Dahlgren so that was philanthropy there that got that building named but um, certainly there's a lot of Jesuits who have buildings named after them who didn't give a uh, you know, only gave their wonderful gift of time, so um, to Georgetown. So, uh, but yeah, I think that's a great idea to have a building. I I think um, so. Christy Graves here on the call. She's she was one of the uh, people who launched the Women on the Walls campaign at the medical center. Um, is that correct, Christy? Yes, with um, but through. Georgetown Women in Medicine, uh, not me, <laughs> individually okay. through yeah. Georgetown Women in Medicine. Yeah, do you want to say a little more about that? I, I'd love to invite Dr. Davis, the current president. Oh, great, yes. That if she would like. <laughs> Hi there, thank you, Christy. But really, I have to give, we do have to give credit to Christy for really being the spearhead for um, uh, making this wonderful um, opportunity happen. But, you know, um, this was a project that Georgetown Women in Medicine um, uh, uh, made recognition of as we went through, and Christy, you can clarify the exact numbers for me, but um, we went through looking at all of the walls along throughout Georgetown, that is, and noticed that there was a very scarce paucity of women, as you could only imagine, and as you probably have seen yourself, there are literally, I think, three pictures of women, uh, and I think there is a duplicate of one, so um, maybe even just two, um, throughout all of the portraits and pictures across our wonderful university. And so um, the campaign was started to, um, it was called the Women on the Walls campaign, and it was to um, begin to um, add, not necessarily replace, but replace sometimes um, uh, pictures, most importantly to have the faces of women, important women who have 
um, had significant um, impacts throughout Georgetown's history. Um, and um, we, let's see, we started, we have now a portrait of um, Estelle Ramey, who is a very famous physician. Uh, and she is someone who we honor through the Georgetown Women in Medicine um, annual awards ceremony every year. Uh, we have our very own um, uh, Miriam Toporovich, uh, who is in um, the uh, Gorman Auditorium. Um, and we have also a beautiful portrait of um, Prince Kumar, um, which is now up, and a fourth portrait. Um, why am I blanking? Joy Williams. Joy Williams, right outside of the, uh, in the Medden building, right outside of the big uh, lecture auditorium. Uh, and we are looking to add to those wonderful trailblazers uh, because there are just so many and we've just learned, I've just learned about two more wonderful women who absolutely I think should be honored. So maybe Jane, we can sort of do something to work together to try to have some sort of proper um, uh, accomplishment, um, acknowledgement of their accomplishments. Christy, please okay. add if you want to that. Sure, I'll, I'll just add briefly that um, the former Dean of Medical Education, uh, Dean Mitchell, was also a strong supporter and um, brought to life the, the portraits of um, Dean Williams and uh, Dean Kumar. Mm -hmm. So lots of partnerships along the way. And I, I don't know if there's a protocol for building naming, but one way that Georgetown Women in Medicine has worked is to gather the evidence. And so collect all the names of all the buildings and then do an audit to see if we can do the gender identity of the namesakes and then present the evidence and say, what can we do about this to uh, leadership? So that's one strategy. I don't know if there's a form. Maybe there, there's a GMS process for this. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like maybe that's a that would be a fun project for one of your students, Professor Danielovich, uh, for the culture, medicine, and is it what is the class now? Nope, oh, you're still muted there. there yeah, you go. I have to remember the order of words, but it's medicine, race, and gender, or gender, race, and medicine, or okay, it's, it's not the current semester, so it, it escapes me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that might be an interesting uh, project for students to do an inventory of the buildings on campus and see see how the numbers look. Um, yeah. I have a feeling that numbers will tell the story <laughs> or re reveal the problem. <laughs> yeah, an image audit. That's right. <laughs> So, well, if there's no further questions, um, I'll, I'll hang on till till six. So, if anybody has any last comments or or questions, I'm here. But you know, feel free to jump off and get dinner. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you again to you and Carlos and also to our partner, the Georgetown Women in Medicine and, and Georgetown Wise for co-sponsoring this event with us. Um, we hope to hear more and thank you for bringing light to, to, to these two uh, or onto these two women. Yeah, no, it's just so meaningful to see this come to fruition because I remember when you first mentioned it what, when, what semester was that? Was it in the, I guess it was the spring of 2020. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was the pandemic yeah. spring. Yeah. yeah. This is, I keep saying this, this, this was really, really, really fantastic work. Thanks, Bill. Sure. Yeah, it's funny when I first proposed doing a film for a thesis project, um, in the liberal studies program, they turned it down. They said, you know, it really needs to be a traditional paper and they just couldn't, couldn't see letting a film be, um, take that spot. So 
I decided not to do a thesis. I took classes instead, which turned out great. I, I had some wonderful classes instead, but this is like an extra credit thesis, unthesis project. So um, it was fun. I did it as an independent study with Professor Danielovich. So it worked out great. When one door closes, <laughs> open a window. Thanks everybody. Thanks for all the the awesome comments too and the support. Yeah, thanks everyone. Carlos, thanks, thanks for coming in between classes. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, 15 more minutes and I'm back. <laughs> okay. And I saw your note about putting it on your YouTube channel, which that would be great um, if okay. you want to do that. And then we can, I mean, I, I, I'm happy to have this video go wherever it wants to be, so. Get, just kind of get it out there for the public. Yes, Kim. Jane, I love, we're in the process of updating our woefully, um, woefully behind um, website, but as part of our update, I would love to add this to our Georgetown Women in Medicine um, update on our, uh, I think this would be our first official um, uh, film. So that, that would be an exciting addition to sure. in Medicine. And um, I would love to talk further about maybe doing another airing um, uh, in in the um, in the spring sometime um, through uh, through Georgetown Women in Medicine. This is really oh. I think this is really powerful work, and um, as many people have said, I think really it needs way more publication and way more support and um, knowledge about these um, these two uh, these two women. So let's try to yeah. let's get together and try to figure some things out for going forward. Okay, that sounds great. You know where to find me, I hope so. Absolutely. Take okay. Care. Thank you. All right. I'll text you about that uh, YouTube thing, Jane. But okay. thank you, everyone, so much. Yeah. Thanks, Carlos. Enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.